So welcome everyone to the SPJ webinar, Lessons Learned, Top Tips as Journalism Schools Embark on the Accreditation Journey. My name is Bailing Shaw and I am the chair of this year's SPJ Journalism Education Committee, which is hosting the session. So our session today is being recorded. Um, and the recording will be made available afterwards to the folks who are interested in accreditation. This is the second of a two-part series in which the Journalism Education Committee is partnering with the Accrediting Council on Education in Journalism and Mass Communications to educate people about the journalism accreditation process. Our first panel was offered on July 12th, and that panel was titled To Be or Not to Be Accredited, How ACE JMC Accreditation Can Help or Hurt Your Journalism Program. That recording is also available, and we can make that link available later to the people who would like it. So just as a quick reminder and to make sure that all of us are on the same page, what we're talking about today is program accreditation. So this is specific to an academic discipline. This is not about an individual accreditation or certification. This is not a university's regional accreditation. Um, this is really specific to journalism and mass communications as academic disciplines. So for our journalism and math communication accreditation, we do have eight standards of accountability, and um, those are available on our website. And let me run through them really quickly. The eight standards are number one, mission, governance, and administration. Number two, curriculum and instruction. Number three, assessment of learning outcomes. Number four, diversity and inclusiveness. Number five, faculty. Number six, student services. Number seven, resources, facilities, and equipment. And number eight, professional and public service. At this time, I'd also like to um, correct something that I misspoke on our July 12th panel, and that is to clarify accurately that um, with respect to the course offerings of any given semester, 50% or higher of the courses that your unit is offering have to be taught by full-time faculty, regardless of whether those full-time faculty are tenure line faculty or not. So that's just to clarify from the previous panel. So with me here today um, are three esteemed panelists who I'm really pleased to introduce. First, we have Pat Curtin, who is the Executive Director of the Accrediting Council for Education in Journalism and Mass Communications, which we endearingly refer to as ACEJMC, or just the Council, which is currently housed in the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. We also have Sonny Alvarado, who is with the Arkansas Advocate. He is the current SPJ rep to the Accrediting Council. He is a past SPJ president, and he's the veteran of many, many accreditation site team visits. And finally, our last panelist is Steve Guyman, who recently retired from Bloomberg News. He is a current public member of the Accrediting Council. He is a past SPJ representative to the Council, past SPJ president, and he's the veteran of more than two dozen site visits. I'd also like to mention that um, chairing the SPJ Journalism Committee for the next um, 18 days is my privilege, but in my paid job, I serve as the Dean of the College of Communications at Cal State Fullerton. I'm also a member until September 30th um, of the Accrediting Council as a representative of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communications. So for today's panel, what we're going to do is review briefly the accreditation process and the accreditation costs, followed by some top tips for the self-study, and then we'll move on to some questions that were previously submitted um, to the panelists, and then we'll end with some audience Q&A. So to start, Pat, I'm going to ask you if you could please briefly explain the accreditation process and tell, much, tell us how much it costs for programs to pursue accreditation. Thank you, Bayling. Uh, I'm Pat Thompson, and I have been executive director um, about, about five years. Um, I, I have been involved with accreditations for, for, more, than, for more than 20 years. 
um, involved with, with psych teams during that time. And I, um, some of you may know uh, Suzanne Shaw, who was the, you know, the longtime executive director for more than 30 years. Um, so I'm going to just uh, talk for a few minutes about process and cost. Thank you all for being here. I recognize a couple of names. Um, of, of people I've, I've been in contact with over the, the last year or two. So I'm, I'm glad you were here. I do have a, um, just a, a little document that I'm going to try to share. I, I don't, I didn't practice it today, so I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'm going to try, um, see if it comes up. Okay, good. It's showing. Yes. Okay. So, um, if you are interested in, in, uh, seeking accreditation for the first time, um, and I'm just going to do the basics with the costs. As you can imagine, they 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 vary depending on a lot of factors. Um, there is a a one-time application fee of one thousand dollars that you will pay, and um, after you are accredited, you would pay two thousand dollars in annual dues. So we currently have 119 accredited schools. Um, each of them pays two thousand dollars a year to us for their dues. And I will say. Um, we are one of the, the less expensive of the uh, national accrediting bodies. And our our dues have been $2,000 for, for many years. We, we have not increased our dues in recent years. Um, so uh, once you get on, on the schedule for a, um, for a, a site team visit, um, th there are some costs that you will reimburse uh, for, uh, for our teams. You will be assigned a pre-visit team to visit your campus to see if you are ready for a full site team visit. Pre-visits, pre-visit teams are usually two people, occasionally one, um, and they spend a couple of days on your campus and they will produce a report that will say this school uh, is, is ready for a site team report in, in two years or this school is still has a long way to go to meet half of our standards and therefore may take five years for them to be ready. Um, once you are on the schedule for a full site team visit, uh, you will reimburse the expenses for your for the, the site team members. That will include their travel, their hotel, their meals. Uh, the size of site teams varies greatly, as you can imagine, depending on where the school is located, um, the size of the school. Uh, the minimum size for our site teams is, is three people. That, that would be for a, for a school that has um, a, a few faculty and uh, not many different areas of concentration. Some of our larger schools that may have you know, more than 60 full-time faculty and uh, you know, a couple thousand students, their site teams may have seven, seven or more members on them. So the cost will depend on how many site team members are, are coming to your campus. And then you also pay for the site team chair to present the site team recommendation at the at our committee meeting, which in recent years has been in March in Chicago. So those are the those are the uh, primary costs. Um, the we strongly re recommend this is not mandatory, but we strongly recommend that um, our directors attend the committee and or council meetings for a couple of years before they come up for review. I think anybody who's been through this will tell you that is very valuable. Um, and you certainly will want to attend the committee and council meetings when your school is being voted on. Uh, next year, our committee meeting will, will again be in Chicago. And if, if any of you, you know, want to attend the committee meeting, just, just uh, send me an email and I'd be happy to ask, uh, add you to the list to get the invitation. The council meeting is planned for uh, the first uh, weekend in May and it will be in Washington DC next year. Um, so we're, that's a little bit of a switch from where it's been uh, for a while. And then once you are accredited, you come up for reaccreditation once every six years. So it's every once every six years that you will be reimbursing travel expenses for a site team, not, not every year. Some people get a little confused about that. Um, we we do um, in recent years. We've also been doing um, workshops for our uh, for directors of our accredited programs. We've been doing them in virtual meetings in May. Um, we used to do them in person. Obviously, the virtual meetings save a lot of money and time for everybody. And we will be doing another one of another one in uh, next May. 
So the process is that site team comes to your campus. Um, site team visits usually start on Sunday afternoon and they end Wednesday morning. So a site team will be on your campus. They, there's usually a tour of the building on that Sunday evening. They, they're on your campus all day Sunday, uh, all day Monday, all day Tuesday. And then they're usually gone by noon on, on Wednesday. So that'll give you an idea about you know, how, how many nights of hotel rooms and so forth there are. The site team will draft a report that they will present before they leave your campus. They will spend a uh, couple of weeks editing and correcting any maybe factual errors that may be in the draft report. And then their recommendation then goes to, to our national committee, which again is the one that meets in March in Chicago. Um, the committee uh, votes and then they make a recommendation on, on whether you should get, and there are three choices, um, accreditation, provisional accreditation, which is still, you are accredited, but it means you have two years to show that you are you have fixed the issues that the site team has found. And the third choice is denial of accreditation. So the, the site team will make a recommendation. The committee then rec makes a recommendation that goes to the council. The council makes the final decision. Um, and we do have, uh, we do have uh, policies in place that uh, schools can submit letters of response to the site team recommendation and to the committee recommendation, and they can appeal the final council decision. So we have all of that in place. So I think I will stop there. And if anybody has questions about that later, I'm happy to answer them. And I oh. need to stop sharing my screen and figure out how to do that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank we go. you so much, Pat. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So basically, as Pat explained, what programs have to do then is you get some consultation, you write the self-study, you host a site visit, and then if you can, you attend the committee meeting in March and the council meeting in April and May. Um, all of this process really is grounded on one of the most important things that programs do in this process, which is to write a very strong self-study. So Sunny and Steve, y'all have both served on multiple site teams over the years. And um, one of the things that site team members are expected to do is to read that entire self-study before they show up on campus for the site visit. So um, Steve, let me go ahead and start with you. What are your top three tips for putting together a strong self study show don't tell uh show me what the program is doing show me what they have done over the past six years and write clearly concisely uh, what you're all about what you're trying to do what you have done and don't hide any failings that you are aware of uh share those too because we'll find them the site team will find them in our examination while we're on on campus so the first thing I would say is show, don't tell. Um, we found too many schools, or I've had a number of programs where they've spent a lot of time on generalities, platitudes, but not a lot of specifics, making it very hard for us to make a determination about what the program is all about. I, I, the other tip that I would, I would share, I don't know if I have three, but I certainly have two. We're communication programs. We have PR in most cases, we have advertising, and we certainly have journalism. These are communication skills. Treat the self-study as a very big, long news report or a documentary, something that's conveying facts and information to an audience that knows very little about your program, that knows what it knows from the document you, you presented, oftentimes within three to four weeks before the team arrives on campus. In, in, the, in the last couple of years, I've gotten reports where I can't make head or tails out of what's in the document because they're writing for themselves. They're not writing for this external audience, which are the accreditors who come onto campus to present a report. So show, don't tell, be concise. Don't hide your warts. Don't hide your deficiencies. The other thing I would say is brag about your successes. Talk about what you've accomplished because in, in the last year, we went onto a campus where going in, we looked at the report and said, this program is, they're pretty weak on several of these standards. And we got on campus and realized they undersold themselves. They underwrote themselves. And we were able to get them to the uh, reaccreditation recommendation. 
Great. Sunny, what would you add to those in your top two? Well, I'm, I'm going to riff off of some, some of those. One, one is, yeah, you know, it's, it's the thing to do is strive for directness, you know, clearly and concise, clear and concise language, right? For an audience that may not be familiar with academic issues or academic jargon, um, my other, you know, another take I have is length does not equal quality. <laughs> you know, um, I've, I've seen some self studies that are hundreds of pages long and yet there's still information missing from the report. And that, you know, that requires team members, site team members to go and track down that information um given the fact that we're only there essentially a day and a half to actually find out you know our role as site site team members is to see if what you say in your self study is actually what exists on the ground so be clear and concise you know don't undersell yourself but don't oversell yourself you know treat it more like a news report than a marketing tool because you're not selling us on the, you know, you're not selling us to, you know, attend your school. <laughs> you're trying to convince us, show us that you have met the standards and, you know, that the information is in your report. Obviously there's some last minute information that comes up that you'll have to have available for us when we get there. But, you know, we've been in situations where I've been in, on teams where we had to go and track down people to find out information that should have been in the report. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with Steve. Show, don't tell. Uh, clear and concise. You know, if you pad it just to make it longer, we can tell when that happens. You know, I used to be a, a journal in, uh, adjunct instructor, <laughs> you know, plus I'm an editor. I know when things are being padded because, you know, the person writing it <clears throat> hasn't done their reporting, basically. So that's my that's my take. Let me let me add one thing to what Sonny said. After the input, after you write the report, make sure the report is edited so that it has a common voice throughout and inconsistencies are corrected, changed, or identified. And so you don't end up with embarrassments of contradictory information within the same report, which does put a question, a seed of doubt in the minds of the site team members. You know, it's an easy process to edit that document at the, at the end before you send it off to the uh, council office and then onto the site team. Yes. It, it, let me jump on that too. It's, it's, you know, often, you know, not often, but there have been occasions where you can tell that the report was written by different people, which is usually what happens. You know, right. the, the head of the department or program assigns different chapters to different people, but then there wasn't any editing and you can tell, and it does create conflicts or contradictory information that you do have to then, okay, what is this really about? So thank you. Pat, what would you like to add about the self-study? I've got a couple of tips that I just thought of. I, I will just very quickly say two things. One is um, if you if if you have the 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 staff, it's to it's in your best interest to have someone every year um working to collect the the data and and check on where you how you're progressing. The worst thing you can do is wait until the year before the, the site team is coming to um, start gathering all of your information, because that's when you realize there are a lot of things you haven't done um, and you, you're playing catch up. And, and that's it's very, very obvious when you when we read self-study reports and I've I've read hundreds <laughs> Um, th when, that somebody has thrown it together at the last minute and, the, and they haven't had time to think about it. The only other thing I would just mention that I um, going back to when I was talking about site teams, um, site teams are made up of, um, we, we call them practitioners. I've always thought that was kind of a weird word, but that's we say practitioners and educators. 
Steve and Sonny are both practitioners on on the on the teams. Um, but each team does have educators on it too. We we always have a mix of educators and uh, educators and practitioners. And we also um, we we strive for very very diverse teams too, and and diversity in every every sense of the word. So um, there there will be a lot of different people looking at the report, and and you do have to you know write it for the for an audience that is coming in from the outside. Yeah, I think I would underscore what Pat said about knowing your audience, which for the self-study, your audience really is that site team, which does have the educators as well as the practitioners. Um, the site team also usually has one member per academic area being reviewed, right? So you don't have to worry that you have to explain what advertising means. There's going to be somebody on the site team who knows that. Um, that said, my tips would be that um, the articulation of your unit identity needs to be very clear. You're being compared to what you say your own standards are. You're not being compared to some other program. So it's really important in the self-study to kind of establish your institutional context, as well as your own unit's vision and mission, which is why those things are part of that very first standard on um, governance. My second suggestion is that um, you do your best to avoid jargon campus specific jargon um, and to avoid acronyms to the extent possible, right? Like every single campus has its own software, its own committees, its own names for the different functions of the work. And if I went to a Cal State Fullerton meeting and said, oh, I just pulled the OBIEE report, everybody would know what I mean. But if I write that in my self-study, nobody has any idea what OBIEE means, right? Because it's a different campus. Um, and then my last tip along the lines of kind of good writing, editing for common voice, cross-checking and cross-referencing, um, as someone from a public relations background, the first word of that area, public, has six letters. And I used to always tell my public, relating, public relations writing students to do a spell check for the misspelling of that first word uh, for five letters, because it's very embarrassing. And yes. if you just do a quick spell check, you can just be sure that the misspelling is not anywhere in your document. So those would be my tips. Um, okay, anything else about the self-study before we move on to the question of who is actually doing all this work? Because it's a lot of work. Okay, so one question that has come up is, does every faculty member have a role to play in the accreditation process, or is this just like a special passion project for a small group of people who really, really care, and then everybody else just kind of checks out? Um, maybe, Sunny, could you go first? Because you mentioned how um, unit leaders will farm out chapters to different faculty. Right. Yeah, and, and <laughs> yeah, it it should be a complete team effort. I, I know that faculty members, you know, are all very busy people and they serve on a bunch of different committees. But, you know, if, for example, if, if the head of the program appoints a team of four people and there's a faculty of eight, those four people should not be the only people involved in the process. The other four should be involved you know, when they get asked, you know, for some information or asked to provide input to the members of that team that's actually writing the report, they need to be involved. Uh, I've heard often, you know, in, in some site visits that, well, you know, nobody, nobody from the team asked me my opinion about anything or, you know, that's when you know you have you might have some issues because obviously not everyone provided information. There could be some missing information there. So it's, you know, so, you know, from my perspective, it's like a reporter going out and talking to several council, city council members, but not talking to the mayor about a key issue. So, yeah, that that's important. Everybody should be involved, even if you don't care about the accreditation process. Okay, Steve or Pat, would you like to jump in on this one? I would I would embellish that by by noting that when the site team is on campus, our assignment is to talk to every member of the full-time faculty. 
And you want to make sure that every member of the faculty knows what's in that, that report. The ideal circumstance is everybody's involved. It's a whole of department, a whole of unit uh, exercise. But before the site team arrives, every member of the faculty should be familiar with what's in that report because it does not reflect well on the program to have members of the faculty unaware of what was in the report, unaware of the goals and aspirations of the program. Um, it's, and it's a good way for a program to improve itself by looking at itself and working on itself as part of the self-study, but somewhat separate from the formality of accreditation and reaccreditation by, by the council. And, and one, one thing I would just add to that, I agree with what, everything that they've said. It's, it's in the faculty's best interest to be involved in this, absolutely. I will say the flip side of, of, of the comments Sonny made, there certainly are, are places where um, the, administra the administrators don't do a good job of involving the faculty, but I've also seen cases where faculty have complained that they haven't been involved, but there is evidence showing they were invited to be, <laughs> to be involved <laughs> and they didn't show up. Uh, so I, I've seen that that happen too, where um, the 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 there's an effort to do that, but it but it's a lot of work, and some people just don't don't want to be involved. Um, but certainly, we would expect the directors of programs to be sharing the the draft reports and getting comments and input from everybody. And as, as Steve, I think mentioned, every faculty member if at all possible, every full-time faculty member, if possible, is going to be interviewed and you're going to be asked about specific questions about the standards and what the school has been doing. Um, so it's it's important for the faculty to know how to, how to respond to those questions. So. so this leads me to my next question, Pat. Maybe you could start. What happens if faculty members disagree about a practice or a priority? Um, you know, because faculties can be all different sizes with different personalities. But do you, I mean, is the site team expecting to show up and everything is kumbaya where people agree on always everything? Or how, how do we handle situations where there is some disagreement, whether it's about superficial things, or about fundamental things? Um, so, no. Uh, we do not expect everything to be kumbaya. <laughs> not on not on campuses, not in newsrooms, not really, not anywhere. Um, so, what the, the way I would explain it is that we're we're, we're looking for patterns. Um, uh, we certainly don't expect faculty to agree with everything their dean or their director is doing. We don't ex we don't expect there to be com you know consensus on everything. But we if if some problems are cited. We look for patterns. We try to, you know, if you're on a five-person team, you're talking with the other site team members about what they're hearing um, from the people they're interviewing, and you you try to come up with, you know, report that reflects what the concerns and issues are. But I, I always tell people because certainly there are there are faculty who think that the accrediting team is going to come on campus and solve my individual personnel problem that I'm, you know, that I'm, I've got HR and other people investigating. That is not what we do. That is, we should not be doing it because we're on your campus for, you know, a couple of days. Um, so you have to be careful to not get drawn into that, but to do look for, for patterns and trends and, you know, just ask a lot of questions of a lot of different kinds of people about those kinds of issues. So let me ask my next question. So first to clarify, um, Accreditation, we talk about an accredited unit, unit, right? That unit could be a college with multiple departments. That unit could be a department inside a broader college. That unit can sometimes be a program within an academic department that has its own budget um, um, budget control. So in what ways, if any, should uh, administrators or other folks up the food chain, so to speak, who are outside of that unit being accredited, be involved, whether um, it's writing the self-study or reviewing the self-study or in the site visit process? Well, I'll start with that, but others chime in. Um, so th they should... It's very important that the self-study focus on what is up for accreditation. And sometimes it is hard to do that because 
a, a large college or a school will include so much information about uh, programs that are not up for accreditation that the type site team has to sort that out. But there's certainly, they certainly can be involved um, in um, help helping the, 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 uh, the, the accredited unit, you know, prepare the other, the other place that comes in, there are some meetings that take place during the visit with the, with the full team where um, you are expected to bring in um, others who interact regularly with your students. So for example, that Monday lunch um, might include some of the people from other uh, other parts of the, the the college or school that are that are not being accredited. It could you know it it could include your uh, history department chair because your students are you know taking history classes. Could include your honors college dean. These are people who know your students and can talk about how they compare to other students at the university and to give feedback about. Um, you know, questions that, that will come up about, you know, leadership on the campus with the faculty and so forth. But it is very important that the self-study, um, the team is coming in to look at the accredited unit. That that is what that we are voting on. We're not we're not voting on the 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 unit that didn't want to go through accreditation. So it's important to separate those. Sure. Um so are there any other tips related to kind of bringing in uh, administrators outside the unit, um, as well as any tips for, say, maneuvering political admi or administrative hotspots or challenges? Uh, Steve or Sonny, any thoughts? I, I would all start uh, and just hopefully the director or the dean or the person responsible for the program has a good working relationship with their immediate supervisor, superior, whatever you want to call it. A director to the dean and you hope that the dean has a very good working relationship with the provost as you go through the, the food chain up to the president uh, i've been surprised on some visits at how familiar with the program the provost or the dean is as you go through the process and it's a rare occasion when the president is knowledgeable about the program it's happened a few times but definitely you want the dean or the next level up outside of the department outside of the accredited unit to have some familiarity. And that speaks to the relationship between the head of the program and the person in charge of the school, college, whatever it is. Um, and I would just think, not being an academic, I would think you need to do that on an everyday ongoing basis just to have harmony within the unisphere, the ecosphere of, of the university as you do getting through the accreditation process. Sure, Sonny. Um, I'm, I'm just going to echo Steve. Uh, it's I think it's important in any work situation, and particularly with the accreditation process, for the head of a program to have, um, you know, a really good relationship with their direct reports, and uh, to in this case specifically that you know their direct, you know, the dean and the provost, know something about the program, be familiar with the program so that when members of the site team talk to them, because uh, we do, you know, we get a sense that, you know, they know what's going on uh, and not that, you know, it's just total. <laughs> There's one case I, I remember where, you know, the dean was not particularly engaged so uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. So I'll say this from the perspective of a dean is I don't want to find out anything from the site team that I didn't already know from my unit right. head. Right. I, 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 I have been in some some sessions, not many, where it's surprising when the, the deans, when you bring up the uh, some of the concerns that the site team has found, which which many times are in the self-study report, the dean has no idea. I mean, I've I, they, they've literally said, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> that's that's not a good answer. <laughs> we, had yeah. a, we, had a, we had a program that I won't mention names, but it's going to be pretty evident if you look through the reports. We had a program that had breached the 20 to 1 ratio of mm -hmm. students to faculty in a skills class repeatedly over the past uh, two decades. Mm -hmm. When we brought that concern to the provost, the pro the explanation we got was, the budgetary constraints were such that they had to continue to put more students into those classes on a routine basis. When we got to the provost, 
and mentioned this as a concern on the part of the council, a serious concern this cycle, the provost looked at us and said, but every program that's subject to outside accreditation gets a variance, gets a, gets a pass, gets a waiver to be able to meet the accrediting standards for that program. The unit was not familiar with this. And as a result of, you know, there was miscommunication or lack of communication after our visit, that lack of communication was gone and the program got the relief it needed. And it's now hopefully will continue to be in compliance. That's one benefit to the accreditation process. One benefit of us being on campus, talking to people up the food chain, you know, to the provost and then on to the president. Yeah. And I would say also that good relationship between the unit head and the other folks up the food chain is increasingly important as administrators change on an increasingly rapid rotation. Right. I think site teams have gone to places where, you know, like there's just a lot of rotations of provosts and deans. Um, So every time someone new comes in, it is important for the unit head to kind of educate that person. Okay, so the next question that I have for the panel is tell us a little bit, if you would, about student involvement, like how much should the students be told about the process? How do the students get involved? Um, And while we're talking about it in the interest of time, let me combine students with alumni. How and when can alumni contribute to this process or participate in it? So who'd like to go first? I'll just start just briefly say that um, they, they actually are very, very important in this, in this process. And there's actually an expectation that they they will be, uh, we, we ask that the units um, very prominently, um, uh, you know, and, and, and communicate with their students to let them know that the accrediting team is on campus. The, the team meets with st- students in two different meetings. One is a large group meeting and then the second is um, our smaller group meetings that are divided by specialty. So that's a requirement. And so we do expect units to, to tell students who we are and, and why we're coming. And um, and we we even even beyond those meetings, we seek stu- like student group groups out, uh, lead- leaders of some of the student organizations. We visit your, the student media on campus. And it's the same with alumni. There are standards that require alumni to be interviewed either be, usually before or, or during um, the, the visit and, and alumni sometimes come to that that Monday, uh, alumni and al- employers sometimes come to that Monday lunch I was mentioning. Great, anything else to add quickly from Sunny or Steve on that? So- uh, if- I, can, I can say that, um, I can say there, there have been a couple of occasions where the need to get students involved was not clearly communicated somewhere along the line. And, you know, it's <laughs> the the large meeting with students ended up being like five students. And, you know, we had to really beat the bushes to try to find, you know, students, you know, and we understand that, you know, it'll usually be the most engaged students or the, uh, you know, the best students who are put forward by by the program, but at the same time, you know, to kind of blow off uh, the need for student input and, uh, is not good for, for a program. I've seen programs call a class, just say, you go in and meet with the accrediting team. I don't think that's the best way to do it because one class does not a unit make, does not a program make. You do want to have, you want to encourage the students to be part of the process. You want to let them know why accreditation is important to the program, engage them, enroll them in that importance, in that in that uh, project, and have them show up and share their thoughts, their feelings. They may not always have great uh, comments to make about the program. We don't expect unanimity. We don't expect uh, kumbaya, even from the students, but we do want to get that, that uh, you know, sampling of the student life within the program. Yeah, and also if you know that you're kind of you're if you know that you're going to be coming up for accreditation or reaccreditation say in 3 years, really track this year's graduating class and get all of their contact information because part of the self study is reporting on alumni who graduated 3 years previously. 
right? So some of that planning ahead and data collection can be really important. So, okay, now let me ask Pat to outline what happens between the time that the self-study is finally finished and submitted, and then the site team shows up on campus. What is that process? Uh, so the process is that the at that point, the, the site team chair is the, the primary contact for the school because there are all kinds of logistics that need to be set up, as well as the, the site team chair will communicate um, what what questions the, the site team members are, have, have already seen as they've looked at this written report so that they can come, once they get on your campus, they're, they're prepared to kind of seek the answers that they need. Um, so it's, it's really um, the, the site team members are pouring over the, the the report and talking among themselves and and um, getting ready to 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 kind of hit the ground running once they get okay people are always shocked at I mean it is so much work these are I, I don't know if I've stressed it before these are all volunteers we site team members are not paid any kind of honorarium you you work all day and all night um i've been on many side teams where you know we didn't finish in time for a decent dinner on tuesday um it's 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 a lot of work we we do it because we we love it and we we um we value um we value accreditation so much because we you know we feel we're helping we're helping schools improve you know we're setting some standards and we're helping schools meet those standards but it it's real it's really nonstop um, I used to get um, annoyed when I would come back when I, this is when I was working in a newsroom and people would ask me, how was your vacation? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this is the opposite of a vacation. <laughs> so Seriously. <laughs> okay. So Steve, you've been a site team chair a couple of times. Can you shed some light on the conversations that Pat was mentioning when the site team chair is communicating with the unit head before that visit? What are some of those conversations like? It's the, the site team chair, uh, good ones, and I would say almost all of the ones we have now are, are good chairs, reach out to the department head months before the site team gets on campus. Uh, for those schools going up in the fall, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, they would be in contact in the late spring, early summer, talking about what, what, what do you want to know from us? What can we help you with? Uh, what questions do you have about where you stand in the in, in the process at this point? In the two visits I made as a, as a chair, I probably talked two or three times a month, if not more frequently, with some of the directors to just make sure they were ready for our arrival. And it dealt with things like logistics, the equipment in the workroom, the the uh, the transportation from the airport onto campus. You know where we were going to be staying, what kinds of equipment we needed in the workroom. A lot of that has changed now with with uh, electronics, we used to lug these big reports around with us. Uh, it's now all become uh, digital and online, but the, the chair of the program should not be afraid to contact the site team chair with any questions they have in advance of the, of the team coming on campus. You don't want the first contact to be when you show up at the airport the week of the, of the visit. This is an on, I used to describe it as um, with no offense intended, like giving birth to a baby. The two times I chaired a team, I was given the assignment nine months before the visit. And it took that long for us to get all the details worked out, to get on campus, to write the report, to present the report, and to, to achieve you know, reaccreditation. Okay, go ahead, Pat. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, and there are, there are some things that the team members do be before, um, they show up on campus. The school one the school provides a list of alumni and employers, and uh, most site teams will reach out to to those folks be, be, before they get on campus. So because you don't have time to do it when you're there, and plus you know people may not get back to you immediately. So you you want to give them time. So you, you the site team is actually collecting some information even before they show up. Yeah. So basically, the visit, if you will doesn't necessarily only start when people arrive on campus. The visit kind of starts right. before, you know, once your self-study is submitted, right? Because sometimes right. those communications between the unit head and the site team chair, depending on, you know, sometimes they can uh, set the tone, if you will, for the subsequent communications between the chair and the members of the site team, right? right. Um, okay. 
So the self-study is done. The pre-visit communications have happened. Now it is site team visit time. Uh, what are panelists' top three tips to prepare successfully for a site visit? Sunny, would you like to start? You're muted, Sunny. You need to unmute. Yeah. Okay. I Oh no! Wait, you just remuted. I don't know what happened. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I got news breaking here, and I oh, so I oh missed the no. Question. Oh, what, what was the question? <laughs> oh well, let me go to Steve first while you catch your breath. Um, okay. Steve, what are the panelists' top three tips to prepare successfully for a site visit? Uh, first of all, the site team needs to have a place to work. They need a secure work room, someplace that's that's within the department, someplace that's not. Uh, accessible to the the flow of traffic on on campus, but proximity to the department head, to the classrooms, to the faculty members is important. And that workroom needs to have working equipment. It needs to have, and this is going to sound petty, but Pat pointed out, we're working around the clock. Refreshments, snacks, other things to keep the site team fueled between the time they get on campus in the morning until they finish their work at the end of the night on Tuesday, preferably afternoon, but usually it's Tuesday night. You also wanna make sure that there's adequate transportation ability from campus to wherever you're staying. Not many campuses have on-site accommodations. Penn State does, UNC Chapel Hill does, but most other programs arrange hotel accommodations someplace off-site. I think it's very important that you have the um, give, you make sure that the site team has accommodations that their time on campus is not spent worrying about how we're going to get here, where we're going to have dinner, what what kind of equipment are we going to use in our in our workspace in our workroom, and that that should be the last thing the team is worrying about when they're on campus. And I will I will stress the importance because it's, it's happened a couple of times in the recent couple of years. Equipment not working in the workroom, printers not being set up to print out the documents on the on the final day, uh, adequate pens, pencils, other uh, uh, tools required to do the work you need to do. You know, some places provide great accommodations, great working space. Other places seem to do it as an afterthought, and I I would not, I would I would caution that the workroom perhaps is the most important element of what the site team does, because that's where they're going to do their work. So in addition to everything Steve said about the workroom, that workroom also needs to be secured and accessible only to the site team members. Because the other thing is going into that workroom, um, if you still have paper files, would be things like, you know, the hiring files for the past several hires, the tenure and promotion files. So there is confidential stuff in that workroom. So it needs to be secured um, where folks who are not part of the site team may not access it. Plus, everything the site team is doing is not to be just like randomly distributed, right? Because it's a confidential process within the confines of that team. Um, Sunny, if, do you want to share some top three it, tips to, for us? Yeah, to yeah, to um, you know. Aside from the snacks issue and 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 drinks, you know, uh, it's always good if if before the site team arrives, you know, site team members are asked whether or not they have any special dietary issues, uh, and you know, do they prefer diet coke or does <laughs> or uh, just water or whatever, you know, uh, it it seems kind of picayunish, but it, uh, it's it's important because we're focused on our work. And we don't want to have to go track, you know, tracking down stuff that will help us stay hydrated or, or energized while we're doing it. You know, and typically on the, for sure on the Tuesday, I can't remember on the Monday, usually we have a working lunch. So basically, you know, the, we rely on the, um, uh, on the department or program to provide, you know, bring in some, you know, uh, sandwiches, box lunches, whatever. Tuesday. Um, that, that's the Tuesday working lunch. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, oh, darn. Oh yeah. I, you, you mentioned the thing I was going to hit on Bay Ling is, you know, it has to be a secured room. Um, and 
access to a printer is good. It's also a good idea ahead of the visit to ask whether or not the team members are bringing their own laptops or if they need to have a computer set up for their use in in the uh, in the workroom. Um, you know, I've been in all sorts of situations. You know, we had great Macs for everybody. Uh, you know, and they were all networked. Or and then you know, been in situations where all of us brought our own laptops, and we just net use the uh, school network to hook up to the printer to make sure that we could print because we do. That's a key thing. We do need to print that report out on Tuesday night. We make a copy for the uh, head of the program. We make a copy for the dean and the provost uh, and the president, if we're at, going to be meeting the president on Wednesday. And um, and then we meet, need copies for ourselves. Uh, that's probably the most use of paper that we'll make while we're there, but we do need that paper. Um, Pat, do you want to add anything? Top three um, let, tips to, for site visits? Yes, I, I'm just going to say a couple of real, real quick things. Um, so the, uh, the, the d director of the unit um, will get um, uh, memos that, that outline things like how to set up the workroom and um, uh, the, uh, an example of a visit schedule. Now that as, as of course, it's not always followed, but but you, you will get that information in advance, and it will include things like there should be an IT person on call for the entire visit, and we realize that at some of the smaller schools that 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 may be difficult, but that's the expectation that if there is a a technical problem that because because the team has to write its report by Tuesday night, somebody's got to be there to help fix that computer or or solve that Wi-Fi problem or whatever. Um, and the the other thing I would just just say is that it, to to prepare is be sure you spend a lot of time looking at the resources link on the website. It has examples of completed self studies, and we go out of our way to pick some that are from small schools, medium schools, large schools, private schools, public schools. That information is under the resources link from the homepage. There's a whole section on preparing for accreditation. There's a whole section on tip sheets for self studies and diversity plans and so forth. So it, I would say, absolutely spend some time with a lot of time with that in the the year leading up to your visit because a lot of that stuff is already in writing right there. Great. So we're almost out of time, although we did start a little bit late. So are the panelists okay if we go through like five past the hour? Is that okay? Yes. Are y'all okay? Yes. Okay. So hey, Lane, uh, I, I will have to drop off because I, okay. I, I well, got before you go, do you want to leave us with your final thoughts on how accreditation does pay off in the end? Yes. Accreditation pays off because one, um students and their parents are looking for the best schools that they can afford. And, you know, it, it's a cliche, but accreditation is a good housekeeping seal of approval. It means that you have met some very rigorous, your program has met some very rigorous standards. It shows that, you know, you care about quality in your program and meeting the standards. Uh, and I can't say enough about why it's a good idea, but that's, that's primarily my my thing. So, thank you, Sunny. See you later. I appreciate with being all the here. News. Thank you. Yeah. So, Pat and Steve, um, from your perspective as experienced site team members, what have you observed to be the biggest misstep by a program seeking accreditation or reaccreditation? Let's just limit ourselves to one or two biggest missteps. Um. I would say it starts with a self-study that's incomplete, sloppily assembled, poorly written, uh, forcing the team to spend uh, excessive amounts of time chasing after, chasing after data, information, individuals to try to resolve um, the uncertainties, the, the gaps that are left in, in the self-study. Uh, they've got plenty of time, the unit has plenty of time to put this together. 
and to show up on campus or to get the document three weeks or four weeks in advance and see all these gaping holes and gaping may be too strong a word, uh, holes that leave questions in your mind is probably the biggest misstep. Uh, and, and the other one is what I just said on the, the, the preparation of the workroom where you walk in on Sunday night to check it out and it's missing computers, it's missing electrical connections, it's missing uh, the printer uh, link. That's happened as recently as last year where we ended up having to get somebody to put put equipment in place on the night the visit started. And by then it's almost too late. You're spending too much time on logistics when you should be spending time understanding what the program is all about. Right. So Pat, biggest mistakes that you've seen or final thoughts about how accreditation pays off or both? So a um, couple things. Uh, I, I would agree with, with, with Steve that, that um, the biggest misstep is not taking enough time with the self-study report, which is one of the reasons why some years years ago, we actually added, we, we, we added a question at the end of the site team report that says, what was the quality of the self-study report? And those answers are public on our website. So <laughs> you, you and, and, and the teams are honest. I mean, often it'll say, you know, very well done. We were grateful. And other times it'll say we, as Steve said, we had to spend half our time just getting basic information that the school should have provided. Um, so I would say uh, not not taking enough time um, with, with the self-study report. And, and also, I think um, not helping your your faculty understand that one of one of the really gratifying things that people take tell us after this process is. Yes, it's a lot of work, but after they go through it, it is it has helped them understand themselves better. They come out better on the other end for having examined all of these things we asked them to examine, even if they didn't like the answer and they, you know, they they have improvements to make. But it is it is a very helpful process. It forces you to to go through a self, a really rigorous self-examination that that I think um you know, help, helps the school, helps helps all of journalism and communication, helps the helps society. And one of the things I'm very proud, um, I'm very excited about um, is that it, in, in 2005, we're going to go live, make public what, we, what we're calling a searchable database, which means that all of our accredited schools will have a place on our website where every parent and student and anybody in the public can go and call up information to compare all the different different programs. That's something that the council approved some years ago and we've been um, getting it all put together and it, it goes live in 2025, so. Great, any closing comments from you, Pat, and then Steve? Nothing else for me. <laughs> Nothing for me either. Okay, so I'm just gonna close by saying this. Um, at no point in this accreditation process are units going through the process expected to be perfect, right? None of us are perfect. This whole thing is about continuous improvement and just being the best that we can be and always striving to be better. And before you can improve on anything, you have to know where you currently stand. And that takes us back to the importance of the self-study, being thorough and being honest, as we've said at the beginning of the session. So thank you to Pat and thank you to Steve. Thank you to the audience for being here. Um, this recording will be available later from the Journalism Education Committee of the Society of Professional Journalists. And thank you again to the Accrediting Council for partnering with SPJ's Journalism Education Committee on this wonderful webinar, um, which I hope viewers will be able to access via the recording afterwards. So thanks to everyone for being here.